It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk with cartoonists, people in the comics field, in the comics industry, about making comics, about the lifestyle of the cartoonist, about publishing, self-publishing, all sorts of things that surround this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and with me today is one of, well, what I consider to be one of the most important cartoonists working in the <laughs> industry today, Mr. Tin Fam. Hey, everybody. Tin Fam, Cobra Talent on the Twitters. <laughs> on the Twitters. Um... My first question for well, you're let's just say you're the author of a book called Sumo from First Second, mm-hmm. and uh, you drew Level Up with Gene Yang, mm-hmm. no small shakes in the comics world. Uh, but uh, my first question for you as we talk, we're going to talk about Sumo. We're going to talk about this whole idea of every moment is the moment of truth. Uh-huh. Uh huh. We're going to talk about doing solo work and mini comics. I want to talk about mini comics. Yeah. But as I was, you know, doing the show prep for this. You're a hard man to track down on the internet. I had a hard time finding, like, I found your blog spot, which hadn't been updated since 2011, unless, yeah, unless it's password protected or something. <laughs> 2011's a big year. That's a big year. <laughs> I had so much time back then. But I'm not, I, I, I had a hard time tracking you down as, like, as far as like a definitive Tin Fam web presence. So if I missed it, let me know what it is. Really, that there is really no Tin Fam web presence. You know, I, I, I the, the the terrible thing about the blog is that you, if you fall behind on your blog, it's super hard to catch up again. Because you know, I've fallen behind 2011. You know, I, I like I was drawing comics and I, I just like you know I didn't uh, really update it. But now, <laughs> I feel like if I I want to start using that blog again, I gotta like update. I gotta put up so much stuff. So much backlog of stuff that I just like I, I just never want to do it. So um, <laughs> I also have a new Tumblr account that I'm gonna start putting up a new comic that I've been working on. Oh. So um, I haven't really made it public yet, but uh, if people want to go to it, I guess they can check it out. It's called um, it's just please don't give up dot com. Don't give up dot com. That's yeah. your Tumblr. Cool. Comic by Tin Fam. Five pages every Monday. Self-published mini comic version available October 2013. Oh my gosh, it's a scoop. Yeah, that's a scoop. This is the first time I've ever talked about it. And I haven't. so this um, coming Monday is the first time I'm going to be posting the first uh, five pages of, um, of the, the thing. And then every Monday after that, I'm going to have five pages up. Oh so, my gosh, so exciting. Please don't yeah, give up that. The first time, actually, this is the first time anyone ever knows about it. So... That's pretty, uh, it's cool. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. You broke here on comics are great. TV, <laughs> everybody. Um, so, okay. So I want to go in. So you're a cartoonist. You're a high school teacher too. Yes. Yes. So yeah. what grades are you teaching? I teach uh, all grades um, from nine to 10, uh, from nine to 12. I'm actually, you know, at school right now. I don't have any classes. I don't have a class today till, um, later on in the day. I have two free periods in a row. Um, but yeah, I teach at a school called Bishop O'Dowd High School in Oakland, California. And um, I actually teach with Gene Yang. Um, Gene actually got me the job 10 years ago. He's, oh, wow. he's a computer science teacher here at Bishop O'Dowd. And he got me the job because we knew each other through comics. And he, gave me, he got me the job. And uh, I've been working here for that long. And, and I really, you know, I mean, you know, people, when I first got this job, I, I was like, um, uh, I'm going to take this job until I become famous in comics or famous in art. <laughs> and uh, after my first year, I really fell in love with teaching. And now if you were going to ask me if I were going to give up one profession, what I would give up, I for sure would say I'd give up any uh, the other professions other than teaching because wow. I really love teaching. It's it's my career. It's the, the way I want to, you know, do for the rest of my life, you know. So, um so yeah, I, I I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm uh, I, I I'm happy when I come to work every day. It's really fun, and plus I I guess it's fun because I also get to work with like my best friends. You know, the, another art teacher here is another cartoonist, and Gene um, of course is is here, and so we're constantly hanging out and talking and stuff like that. It's fun. It's it's awesome when your day job can be something that you actually truly enjoy. It doesn't feel like work <laughs> anymore, does it? Right. Uh, it's lucky. I just wrapped up uh, an eight-week course that I teach uh, quarterly in Ann Arbor, uh, uh, Graphic Novel Academy. And, you know, there's – 
there's something that's just so wonderful about going in with a plan and the kids hack the class. They take you in some place you never, you never expected to go, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and then they create really interesting things right in front of you. Uh, yeah, there, there's few things that are as rewarding as that. And I mean, I know part of it, for me at least, is that I'm you know, going through the whole thing where I'm watching a kid go through exactly what I went through when they're making comics uh-huh. for the first time. But, um, but also it's just that it's that unpredictability of working with young people. That's yeah, so yeah. much fun, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sometimes I get like, oh, man, you know, this job is just, you know, it, it's the same. But then um, when something that you tell them like clicks and they're attentive and they're it's it's a really awesome feeling that like they are all listening to you. And, you know, and a few of my students have gone on to do more art, you know, to um, uh, do zines and to um, to work in like animation and stuff like that. So they, it's very um Makes me, it makes you feel really good that you have such an influence on kids. Um, and even if they don't do art, you know, just that, you know, your influence and your, um, th- that you're part of their lives in some way, in a good way. Yeah. A, a neat thing. It's kind of cheesy, but. It is, a- but, it, you know, <laughs> it, I, I, once you've experienced it, you realize that that, that, that schmaltziness that, uh, you know, oh, what's his name? Uh, the, the Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of uh-huh. feel of it is, is actually pretty true. It's like, I, yeah, I had a, a, a 19 year old student, former student uh, come back to town and look me up. And first of all, it's like, oh, how sweet. She looked up the old man. But then she says to me something. She's like, it's like you said, so, you said to me once and she said this really smart thing. And I'm like, did I say that? That's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> a, because I had a, a positive <laughs> impact on her life. And B, because, oh, I said a smart thing once and I get to hear it back. Exactly. <laughs> did I really say that? Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the same reason, I, the same thing I love about teaching is the reason I got into comics. I mean, I got into comics because I wanted to make something that would last beyond me you know i wanted to do art that after i die or whatever um that will still be existing in the world you know and still um you know communicate to people and uh now i also do that through kids yeah you know so after i die these kids that um that i taught also go on and there's a little bit of me that i taught i taught i taught you know go on so I love that. Yeah, yeah that is cool. So speaking of the book, let's talk about the second, Sumo, which uh, was published by First Second. It came out in December, didn't it? Yes. And I got to, here's the plug I would give you for the book. Um, it's 1991 and, or a little bit earlier, maybe 1990. I'm in high school and I go to my local comic store and like all, most 15 year olds at that time, I was into Spider-Man. I was into whatever was going on in the Marvel comics world at the time. And I found this really cool out-of-the-way bookstore uh, where he had all these back issues in these uh, long boxes. But in the back, back corner, he had a whole bunch of really out-of-the-way stuff like Epic Illustrated, like Kamiko books, uh, Matt Wagner's Grendel, yeah. uh, you know, Bill Willingham's Elementals, kind of stuff that you just didn't find in the, the spinner racks in the grocery stores back then. And I remember discovering people like Jim Starlin, um, uh, Dean Modern, Ken Stacey, and, and Eddie Campbell. And th- this is something I said to Nick Abadzis about his work as well, who we'll talk about Nick Abadzis, how he was uh-huh. on, you, you do a show too. But um, I said to, to Nick, it's like, it's like, that was the moment where I realized, oh, that's what comics can be. Uh, you know, it, it can be this, this fun, lighthearted superhero stuff, but it can also go into really interesting poetic places. Mm-hmm. And it was like, it was just like a door, a veil just lifted. And it was like, oh, the medium is so much more vast and interesting than I ever thought it could be. Uh-huh. Uh, that's the same feeling I got when I read Sumo. Honest and for true. Oh. This, this book, I'm serious, Tin. This, this is true comics poetry. And I advise anybody who loves their, the, the medium to read this book. And I want to talk about some of the ideas in this book. Um, but, as but, but, you I, know, before we talk about Sumo really quick, I, I, I love that story that you just told because I think everybody in our industry right now has a story like that. And I have a story just like please. that where I got back from college and just, just like so into image and into all the Jim Lee Marvel stuff. And one, one comic book um, guy... You know, like the guy that worked there, he showed me Optic Nerve, you oh, know, and he yeah. showed me um, Chester Brown, and it literally blew my mind. I was just like, what is this? I mean, I can draw comics without having to do these things that, you know, I really don't want to draw, you know? And I was yeah. like, 
this was amazing to me. I remember the first time, and I, I was like, like, oh man, I, and it was like discovering comics all over again, you know? Yeah. So I was devouring all these things, and I was reading good alternative stuff, bad alternative stuff, just like, and then I read Goodbye Chunky Rice. Oh gosh, I, yeah. This, this is like the most incredible thing in the world. It was just, yeah, ever since then, I never looked back, and I was just, For a second there, Tin. We're seeing a, one that I'm always craving to discover, you know? Yeah, yeah. It 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 it, uh, it it shows you a whole new way to even think about the medium. Goodbye, Chunky Rice is a fantastic one. Adrian Tomine, uh, Optic Nerve, awesome stuff. Um yeah, it's like it's like once you have that that breakthrough moment, it, re, it makes you realize that the, there's whole new avenues you haven't even begun to unlock in this medium, right? Yeah. Um but so let's lead into Sumo by talking about you are, you know, into mini comics and you like a, this is how you your inroad into comics was hanging out with a bunch of mini comics makers in the Bay Area. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, I graduated college and I was wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my life. And uh, I, and I discovered all these comics. And um, so then the same comic shop owner was like, well, if you like all this stuff, you know, I, I pretty much read, ran out of things to read. I was just reading everything I could. And finally, he was like, well, you should check out these things called mini comics. I was like, what are those? And then he gave me some and I was reading them. I was like, I, and I, I had never seen one of those things before. And I just couldn't believe that you could do that. I couldn't believe that you could do that. And so I did it. I just decided to do my own. It's terrible. <laughs> the first <laughs> mini comics were just absolutely atrocious. And... Um, and I had a friend that was like, hey, you know, there's a group of artists that meets in Oakland every every week. Do you want to come and uh, draw with them? I was like, okay, sure, I'll come and draw. And, um, <clears throat> and so I go and meet them, and it just so happens to be this thing called Art Night, which is a um, a group of, of people that would meet at Jason Shiga's house. Um, he's Jason Shiga does awesome comics. He does a comic called Meanwhile, which is amazing. And um, Empire State just came out, and um, and we would meet at his house um, in Oakland, and we would just sit and draw. And at the time when I went there, it was Jason Ben Catmull, who's an amazing comic book artist that does a book for Fanographics, um, Gene Yang, and um, and uh, Jason Thompson, and a couple other people. And I, I drew with them. And the neat thing about it, and this might sound bad, but when I met them, I was just like. These guys are geeks like me, you know, they're like, they're, they're nothing, they're nothing fancy, you know, like when you're just reading people's comics, you think, oh man, these guys are going to be, and I realized, I'm just like, these guys aren't anything more special than anybody else, you know, and so that made me really comfortable and I was able to just kind of hang out with them and, and, and then draw with them and stuff like that. And I didn't feel very intimidated and it was very welcoming. They yeah. were, everybody was very welcoming, which is kind of sad because I'm not as welcoming now, but, uh, <laughs> but when I, I met those guys, they were really welcoming and they were very supportive, you know? And so I, I think without them, I would never continue because, um, I really did feel like my first book was pretty bad. And so I just continued doing these mini comics because everybody was doing mini comics at the time. Everybody, I think Gene had, had Gene and Shiga had just gotten to Zurich. And it was a, I remember going, my first day going there and sitting in this huge chair made of boxes. <laughs> and I was like, what is this huge chair made of boxes? What are the, in these boxes? And Jean, uh, and then Shiga said it was, um, it's boxes of um, double happiness, which oh, was wow. for. And I was like, so why are they here? And he's just like, well, you know, I made like 5,000 of them because that's how, how much they gave me money for. And uh, no one's going to buy 5,000. <laughs> Are made out of these these, um, these boxes of comics, you know, and um, but minis were the way to go, and and I was super into it. And then we went. They said, "Hey, you should go to a convention." And I went. My first convention was uh, San Diego, like small press table, way back when nobody went. It was weird because like it's weird to see it now because when we I first started going like ten years ago, there was hardly anybody there, and small press they were like asking for people to be in small press. It was like. I remember it was like $100 for four days or something like that, you know? Wow. There I met an, another inf really influential person. His name is um, uh, Dylan Williams, who um, he, he later becomes the um, uh, a, um, 
a uh, publisher uh, for Spark Plug Comics. Um, but he was super supportive and he was, um, and you know, I, I think at the time when I was meeting with, uh, I was just thinking my comic had to get slicker, had to be more like, like, um, professional, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 uh, higher production values on the illustration and in the, the final printed thing. Right. And Dylan was like, no, I mean, I mean, all that is part of your art. I mean, what you, and that's when it really opened my eyes that I didn't have to do all this kind of slick production value and and that the um, the you know messiness of what I did was part of my art and and the, he he really helped and uh, and then I never looked back and I did comics and I met more people and met more and then just you can see this this community of many comic artists just all and everybody I remember uh, nobody was making any money not at all so like if you weren't losing money, that was awesome, you know? And yeah, time, the dream was to get published by one of these publishers and not get paid for it just so that they would make a book, you know, and it would be in like a comic book store um, or in Diamond. Diamond was a big thing. Oh, it's in Diamond. Um, and I remember me and Gene Yang would have these long conversations where he would just be like, what are we doing? <laughs> I mean, this is, because Gene is a lot very um, he practical. So he's like, we should just quit. I mean, we're losing money. I mean, I lost two hundred dollars, you know, at this convention. You know, yeah, you put all this money into going to conventions, and even back then, it wasn't that expensive, and you would still lose money. And you're like, what? What are we doing? But I told him, you know, at the time, I was like, we're doing it just because we want to do it. It's not, you know, it's really for the love. At that at that time, it was all about the love. There was no money. There was no audience. There was, you know, if no one read my comic, I would have still made them. You know, yeah. So, point it was just about doing it for the love of doing it and it was a very special time i still think about it um and now even though comics is a lot better like the industry you know some of our uh, people are getting paid and they're getting books out on the regular um i still uh have a nostalgia for the, those days where we were just doing it for the love and we're just sitting around stapling comics and stuff um sumo was actually a mini comic you know like first and um, every, you know, everything, and uh, they got picked up and became a graphic novel. So that time wasn't that long ago. And I feel like maybe that time might be returning, you know, maybe this time it's not mini comics, but blogs or, or whatnot. But, you know, it, um, it's coming back, you know, I think. Well, one of the themes of the book of Sumo is, you know, it, it, well, it's, 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 least it's, it's expressed explicitly is every moment is the moment of truth. And I'm when I think about mini comics, you know, I, I'm teaching a lot of kids and I hear it time and time again that, you know, 14 year old kid comes up to me like I've got a 67 volume graphic novel series inside of me and it's gonna be just like bleach. It's gonna go on and on. It's gonna be like one piece. It'd be 75 volumes. And I say, well, that's great, uh, but maybe you should start with a mini comic first because a 67 volume graphic novel is a lot of opportunities to feel the misery and the despair of not being able to finish. Whereas a mini comic, it's like it's quick and dirty, done in one. You get that that emotional high of just finishing something quick. And I'm wondering if like that's you know if there's like a parallel there between this idea of like when you do well, we got mini comics day coming up in Ann Arbor here in, in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's, it's, <laughs> it really is like every moment is the moment of truth. Can I get through this eight page thing in one sitting? Right. Well, you know, um, that's how I approach my art as well. And, uh, I, I kind of approach my life in that way, which is good and bad. <laughs> you know, when I worked with Jean, it was on level up. It was super hard because Jean is a very, um, pragmatic. I don't know if that's the right word. Pragmatic, uh, artist. He, plans everything out, he writes a full script, then he does full thumbnails, then he does pencils in which he, um, you know, he flips the page over backwards, make sure all the proportions are right, wow. then he inks it, and then he, you know, he'll ask people for their opinion, all that stuff. And um, for me, when I draw at comics, I just draw it, I just, and then I'm done. I don't, um, I don't labor over it as much you know, uh, and, and people have asked me, like, my art, you can tell if you look at a page of my art is, is a lot sloppier and uh, or and a lot more just has this kind of unfinished feeling to it. And um, and I've always uh, wondered why I couldn't work the other way. And, and 
one of the reasons I give people now is that basically what it is is that I'm trying to uh, put down what's in my brain um, onto the page as fast as I can because I feel like the more you put between that, like pencils and, uh, you know, like thumbnails and pencils and revisions and stuff like that, um, it changes what you had initially in your head. Yeah. Hey, Matt, I'm wondering if we could pull up the trailer for Sumo. We can watch it while Tim and I talk about it a little bit. Because um, this is an interesting idea that you're talking about. As I was reading the book, I'm thinking this is a metaphor for the creative life is what this is. Is This is like uh, saying yes to the future and not over preparing for it and letting the past be the past. Uh, and it, there's all this, there's all these scenes in the book about, you know, aim for the center. You don't get time to think about this. Just well, strike, right? When I went to see a sumo match, that that's, you know, I'm I, a little bit of a backstory. You know, I, I, um, this is the third version of sumo that, uh, that you, you're holding in your hand. Like, um, I had done a whole 80 page sumo story that then I scrapped and then um, started over and then scrapped again. And then this is like the third version. And um, the, one of the big reasons is that my first version of sumo was kind of like a story that you would expect from a person that doesn't know very much about sumo and kind of into the whole like big guys battling aspect of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to see a sumo match and uh, and it changed, it blew my mind, it changed my life. I mean, um, sumo, the the way that, that, that sumo is done is very, I can relate it back to being an artist and just being in life itself is that, you know, there, there it's, um, it's when you're on, you, you prepare for it all this, your life, you know, you practice and you practice and you sketch and you sketch and all that. But when you get down to it, when you get down to the match, you know, you just have to do it. There's no like, uh, I don't know. There's no hesitation really. It's just, if you are hesitating, then you've already kind of lost, you know, um, you have to decide what it is you're gonna do and then do it. And, and that's what really um, made me um, story. And I was like, wow, that's, this is, this is how I, I want to tell the story, you know. Um, it was it was just an eye, really eye-opening experience. And so, yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, people don't have to approach art or, or life the way I do, because I, um, you know, I am, I, I, I live, I do the mo uh, for the moment thing a lot more than normal people would do. Um, but it's just the only way that I can work. Like if I, uh, if I, if I do do what Gene does, I'll never get anything done, you know. Right. It, it's just too much. Um, and so that I found, you know, I, now at 38, I found that that's about me and that's, so that's, that I've accepted that and that's, I'm trying to make it work for me. Well, it's, it's a lovely message in the book, uh, I think for, even if you're not a cartoonist, this idea that, uh, you know, life doesn't give you a whole lot of opportunities to go, Oh, wait a minute, do over. <laughs> can I, can I do, can I try that again with more feeling? Right. It's like, it's like, it, it, there's a, plenty of times where you either, you know, you, you find out what you're made of and you don't get a second chance to think about it. Uh, but another thing that you just pointed out that I think is really interesting is this idea of, again, speaking as a teacher, uh, you have to break things into a procedure a lot. And I tried to make it clear to my students that this is an arbitrary procedure. This is not the order in which you create something, but I got to break it down into an eight-week course somehow. So there's, you know, you do this now, but you're probably going to come back to it later and touch on it. Um, so you mentioned that Sumo started out as a mini comic and it was black and white too. I want to talk about color in a little bit. Um, and it started with a dream, if I'm not mistaken, right? So um, I, I, I keep a, a, a sketchbook next to my bed because I never remember my dreams. And so once in a while, if I do wake up and I remember my dreams, I'll sketch it so that I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll think about it next time. And I did, um, I, I, I have this, the page still, but basically I had a dream about myself as a sumo wrestler floating in the sky with fishes. <laughs> I don't know. At the time, I, I didn't I, I didn't know what it was. But now looking back at it, I think it's basically just like me stressing out about being fat. And so. Uh, oh, funny. But then I looked at it and I was like, whoa, this is this is super awesome. <laughs> so I was like, I want to do a sumo um, comic. And it took me a long time. I mean, 
it took me at least like six years to actually uh, finish the first version. And that's because I kept starting over. And um, and the, the neat thing, and, and here I'm going to do a little advertising too. My favorite <laughs> thing about being a, a cartoonist is not being a cartoonist, is being a... Um, a part-time cartoonist you know the the best thing that i ever chose in my life was to become a teacher and to do comics on the side um because what it did what it allowed me to do was uh allow me to do my art at my own pace and at my own um you know whenever i wanted and so i people ask me sometimes why did sumo take you so long to do and my answer is well because i it was okay i was i could take a long time so i did you mm. know because i wanted to come you know, um, I'm not an artist that has many stories, you know. Um, you know, Gene has millions of ideas that he's just waiting to do. My wife, Lark, has tons of ideas that she's waiting to do. Uh, I don't, you know. I have. I, I think I was telling someone I might have three books in me. My whole life. <laughs> I have an idea of something I want to do. I really want to do it. You know, I really want it. I, I, not necessarily right, but I want it to come out the way I envision it. So um, it took me a long time to do. Um, I'm a little off now. Okay, so finally <laughs> I did it. Um, and I wanted to self-publish it because I, I really love the mini aspect of it. But it was really big. It was 80 pages, which oh, wow. is not something that you could just fold in half and staple. You know, it, 80 pages is a, a big chunk. So I got this stupid idea to um, Japanese uh, do a Japanese stab bind on it, basically binding by hand with needles and thread. And um, and I silk screened the covers and printed it all out. And it, I found that it took me at first. I was like, I was I was taking it to this comic book convention called Ape. Yeah. And at first, I was um, I was like, oh man, I'm going to do only 200 limited edition signed copies because it's going to take me a long time. And I was working on it, and then I was like, oh man, I'm only going to do 100 limited. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, guess. 50 limited edition, <laughs> only 50 of the actual mini comic floating around. And uh, when I took it to Ape, I, I was going to sell it for $15. And I was like, no one's going to buy a mini comic for $15. That's ridiculous. But I think people like can recognize the work that I put into it. And it sold out. And luckily, one of the people that bought it is uh, from First Second. And they, 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 they liked it. And uh, Gina, I think, bought it. And they, I guess she passed it to Callista and stuff, and they liked it. And oh, they, they publish it. Was yeah. Callista the editor on this book? Was the, um, I mean, I, I, I say, I, I say this in different places, but you know, Callista is an amazing editor, um, and I, I always thought, I always think that it, this book should have both our names on the cover, you know, because. Um, as much as uh, when I did the mini comics, it was as much, you know, is exactly what I wanted as a mini comic. Clista really helped to make this comic from a mini comic that was very personal to me to a mini com uh, to a comic that was not only personal to me, but also um, relatable to everybody. Mm. She was able to um, say, OK, Tin, I know this is good for you and for the people that you know. But if you wanted to have uh, to have the, a wider audience to see, you know, understand this and 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 feel this, then you have to do this, this, and this, and um, and it was great. I mean, it wasn't without you know we had some little minor battles and stuff like that. But um, as you, you know, should over a creative project, right? Um, but she was amazing, and at first I was like, oh man, this girl's super young. I mean, she's like. I think she's like 22. I don't know how old she is, but you know, and I'm just like, what is this 22 year old gonna tell me about my comic? And uh, but she was awesome. It was amazing. It was. Uh, I don't want to. I never want to work with another editor. I think she's like the best editor out there. Well, that's a great plug. She's our guest on the next episode. <laughs> so everybody, tune in in two weeks for uh, Callista Brill is gonna be on Comics Are Great to talk about what an editor does. Uh, but roping back to the the, the original idea here. Um, there's a chicken and egg thing with plot versus message, right? It's like, okay, what do I introduce into the plot to make stuff happen in the story, to get to the point, and what's the point? And so I'm curious, these themes of, right, uh, you know, every moment is the moment of truth, letting, letting the past be the past, that's a big part of the story as well. Um, 
were these there at the outset when you said, I'm going to do a comic about sumo wrestlers? Or was it something you discovered as you were making the book? Or is it something that kind of changed and morphed over time? I mean, how often are you going back to say, well, maybe this is the message, or maybe this plot element would be good for the message, and then you find a whole new message? I'm curious about like how that process works for you. Um, well, for me, it's a little different than uh, some people. I, you know, I don't write full scripts and I don't have thumbnails, like I was saying. Yeah. So I just start drawing. And then however the story develops is how the story develops. So if you guys follow this Tumblr account that I'm doing, um, that's how it's going to happen is that I'm, I have a, an idea and I have kind of like what I want to do. And I'm just going to draw it. And I, and I hope that it will click. Yeah things will come together and that's how, how sumo was i just drew it and things just started to click and, and things click um things happen because of my life you know i mean um it's hard to disguise but basically all of my comics are basically about me you know about what i'm going through and it might be about sumo wrestling so it's like me as a sumo wrestler yeah. and i did this mini comic about a sushi chef but it's really about what i was going through but put onto a sushi chef it's right. sort of like role playing almost where you just take what you're going through and put it on a fictional character um but at the time that i was doing it like for example um you know i was living you know i, I graduated art school and i went to live with my parents because that's what you do when you graduate art school <laughs> And I, I and and in the the span of about I lived with them for about a year and in a span of about about a month what had happened was I'd gotten a job at Bishop O'Dowd, I had gotten a, a girlfriend that I wanted to you know um, uh, you know move in with, um, I had a um, I, ha I was going to move to Oakland you know I'd lived in Campbell California all my life I was going to move to a whole new town a whole new city. And so all those changes happening, and I am not a guy that loves change. I hate change. If I didn't have to change anything in my life forever, that would be the awesomest thing in the world. <laughs> so it was super tough on me. It was really hard, and um, and that I was making this move. And so that's that's what what came into like the past, and 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 the whole you know, part of uh, of the book about him, you know, leaving the United States to go to Japan to be a sumo wrestler is all coming from that that moment in my life. And then you know the other the other things like uh, you know every moment is is uh, is is actually things that that people have said to me you know the whole bar scene in the book is actually true I mean it I I do have a friend who's a bartender his name was Kenny and you know and all that is pretty much true except for I wasn't a sumo wrestler and I wasn't going to go to Japan I was just going to go to Oakland. <laughs> The guy, the guy that was in the book, that that's kind of a, not a drunk, but he does. He's at the bar a lot. He did say to me once, you know, don't worry about this being the moment of truth because every moment is the moment of truth. Uh -huh. And um, and then I was like, as soon as he said that, I was like, rush home, write it down, you know. <laughs> it changes and morphs, and then sometimes I'll like, I'll like, oh man, I got a great idea for sumo, and I'll totally forget it, uh -huh. you know. And so the, um, the, there's just it just it's just really for me the way I work is super organic. Um, I never really know how a comic is going to end until it ends, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and for me to do it by myself, it was great. But to, when I did that type of, I, I applied that aesthetic to working with Gene. It was like nerve wracking for Gene, you know, because he would be like, "Did you read the script? Did you like it?" And I'll say, uh, "I didn't read the script." And he's like, "But you're already drawing it. Why didn't you read the script?" <laughs> <laughs> one page at a time, you know. So when I was drawing, and I think it helps when I do that because when I'm drawing it, I don't, um, you know, I don't spoil anything because I really don't know myself. You know, I'm just, I'm just drawing it as it comes. And um, I found that that's the only way I can work. So that's how I work. Uh, so every story is going to be super organic. I think it's going to be an interesting um, experiment with this blog that I'm doing is because because I my stories are so like that. Uh, I don't print anything until it actually finishes. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is how it is, you know? But with the, with the blog, I'm, I'm posting up five pages every week. So, you know, how it changes and stuff like that. And I'm ready to witness as opposed to just me looking at it, you know? Well, so, if, if It sounds like what you're talking about here is having a sense of faith in your own ability to execute on something. Uh, not maybe not like a, a blind faith of it's going to be awesome and I just know it is, but having a sense of I'll figure it out, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it, like I said, it has a, a um a a, a I, I I'm I am a very confident person, so I I definitely think whatever I do is going to be amazing. How amazing is up in the air, but I I always think it's going to be amazing, and it also has to do with the fact. You know, I don't depend on this to make a living. You know, I do it because I love it and because because um, it's fun and it's fun to get. And so if, if you know, I do this story and nobody likes it, it's the stupidest story in the world. It doesn't matter. You know, I did it. It was fun. I, I did it for the love of it and, and whatnot. Now, if I, I think if I was a professional cartoonist, I'd be a lot more wary. You know, I'd be more like, oh, man, is, is this good enough? Will this get me another book? Will I... You sell this book, whatever, you know, but because I don't, I can kind of just do what I want. And I think that's like my favorite thing about being a, a part-time cartoonist. That that's that's a really really cool way of looking at it, uh, you know. And I, and I love the fact that you've modeled this idea that Raina Telgemeier has talked about this before. Uh, is that her process is entirely intuitive, mm-hmm. and we, I, I think, our creative people, myself included, loved to, to concoct the story of that. I had this thing locked before I put pencil to paper. I prevented any future calamity. And I went through this. I did a graphic novel much in the style of Gene Yang where I wrote the entire thing out in thumbnail form. You know, spent two years doing that before I finally drew the pages. I still got to the point when I was doing the final pages where I was like, oh, you know what? I've completely forgot. I didn't address this point. I got to write in the new scene. I wrote in two new scenes because I didn't anticipate that two years before. You know, so you can't protect yourself from the future but we like to think that we can you know and i and i think that people like you and like reina who can model this idea of like you know there is also just doing it <laughs> just getting in there and making reina talk about her mini comics um past too what's that oh reina yeah did she talk about her mini comics past i we haven't talked about her mini comics on the show i'm gonna have to have her back to actually talk about those days Seeing her at a convention selling her mini comics for a dollar and i remember telling reina like man these com- you can't sell these comics for a dollar. You're just really, you know, undercutting yourself. And then I think flash forward, like, you know, 10, eight years, nine years later, and I'm, I'm asking Raina for, like, um, contract advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I want to talk about, you, know, you talk about this kind of intuiting the process, but um, the book, Sumo, is not without some kind of creative scaffolding in here in the sense that it's told... In a nonlinear fashion, you jump yeah. from the uh, past to the to the. And, and as a matter of fact, I'm going to put it on the the comics cam here. Let me get some stuff out of the way so I can show people what the book looks like. Um, it's cam. Yeah, we've got like an overhead cam where I can actually show what the book looks like to people on watching on the air. So it's told in different time periods. So like in the present. It's an orange color scheme. When you go into the past, it gets progressively cooler. Like in the deep past, it's like a cool blue. But then in the not too distant past, if I can find it, it's green, which we'll talk about in a second. But um, but this but it, the flashbacks get progressively shorter. Like the jumping around sequences get progressively shorter. And I heard you mention something about Ubapo Comics, which we've talked about on the Comics A Great Show in the past, actually episode 23, where we're talking with Matt Madden, who is a big proponent of Ubapo Comics. I uh, learned from it was This is, uh, this is the, the uh, precipice. Uh, well, his, he had a panel, I forgot which Comic-Con, about Ubapo Comics. And that's what... Um, that was the thing that kickstarted the third version of Sumo. So, you know, I did the first one. I didn't like it. Went to a Sumo match, did a second version. Uh, of, I put Matt Madden about Old Apple Comics. And then I was like, that's the second story. And I, I got rid of the second story and started the third one. And um, he really um, changed the way I looked at comics because I was like, whoa, I guess I could do these neat creative things. I'm a huge fan of Steven Soderbergh at the time. You know, I'd seen him, um, uh, what was his, what was the movie that I really loved? Um, like, you know, like all his movies are very non-linear, mm-hmm. you know, and I love how they would all come together sort of at the end, you know, and, and I, I always thought that was super amazing. Um, but, um, uh, with this comic, um, when Matt told, talked about that, I was like, oh, this is, and at the time I was also searching for a way to pace the story. So that would be like a sumo match. Oh. The reason that, um, you know, the, the flashbacks get smaller and smaller and smaller into this, like, really fast 
um, climaxes because that's how sumo matches are. They're, they're, su they're slow and very traditional and drawn out. And then they get on the thing and then bam, it's over, you know? And that's how I wanted the comic to, I wanted people to read it, how it felt, you know? So um, then when Matt talked about this, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. And what's interesting was um, I had set it all up and, and I had done it and it w I finally got it to work um, for my mini comic. And then when I got the deal with for a second, Callista was like, well, you know, this story is only 80 pages long. We're going to need to add like 20 or so pages. And when I was on the phone with her, I was like, yeah, sure, I can do it. Let me get a contract. You know, I was afraid that if I didn't sign a contract right away, she'd take it away from me. So then I sat down and did it. And I realized, oh, my God, you know, because of the stupid old backhoe thing that I set up, <laughs> if 20 pages to the comic, I have to add 20 pages to each section uh, equally. So it wasn't, I couldn't just throw 20 pages at the end or throw 20 pages in the beginning. I had to put two pages here, two pages here, two pages here, two pages here. Oh, wow. That took a lot longer to plan an extra 20 pages than to, um, but it worked out and it, it, it's awesome. Um, and I think that's one of the strongest things. When people read it, some people don't even notice that. Right, right, yeah. I, I, I was aware that it was that the scenes were, the pacing was changing, but I didn't realize that it was informed by the. We should explain what Ubapo comics are, uh, because it's 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 a creative restriction to put on yourself based on poetry, right? Yeah, I, I, I really didn't really understand the whole thing first, but I, um, I read a comic by David Lasky, and it was a comic where every panel. The narration would start with uh, at the first the letter of the alphabet. So the first panel it start with A, and then the second would start with a B. And it was beyond the fact that it did that. It was also an amazing comic. So I was really interested in making an amazing comic that followed it, uh, like had a little old Apple theme to it. That you know, so I was I was very excited to do. It. It's one of the things that made me excited to do sumo was to to try to figure this out. And yeah, so that's how I. I went about. So, but but I love about this idea is is that you you know we're talking about intuiting a story, but also creating an art. Of, I mean, let's face it. I mean, the Obapo thing is a bit of an artificial restriction to put on yourself, uh, but it's it's sort of like hemming yourself in to try to figure out how to get out, and that's when you start creating really interesting things, right? It's neat to do um, that. This this in particular was because um, sometimes you, uh, as a cartoonist or an artist, you can go on for a long time and with this I had there's certain pages where I had to be like I just got to take this down to the bare minimum I only got four pages to tell this part of the story and so I got I can't tell this part I mean this is this is not needed this is not needed okay this is it so you boil it down to like the essential thing and um, that's what I love about it and sometimes you know um, people ask me why like one of the criticisms of sumo, and and a caveat to this is that you know I read the criticisms of sumo all the time, uh, whether they're praise or criticism, and I love them all. I mean, there's not any time where I'm just like, oh man, this guy didn't understand. I hate this guy. I really love um, hearing what people say about it, how they feel about it, and stuff. But one of the criticisms that I've seen um, is that it's too short. You know, like oh, it's just too short. does you know I finished it in 20 minutes. Um, yeah. And um, and I think that has a lot to do with the, the fact that, that, that some people that normally read novels and stuff like that just aren't used to reading comics, you know, like um, there's a lot more going on in a graphic novel than, than just the words. If you were just reading a comic and just reading the words and then, then just flipping the pages as soon as you read the words, you're going to miss out a lot about what's going on in comics, you know, like every picture is telling a story and every gutter is telling a story that the pictures are not telling and the structure of the book and how they put this and why this shot is a long shot and why this shot is a medium shot and why you're doing this angle or plus plus this, this angle and all that is like super important to reading a comic and and um and so i, I always feel like a comic and and you can tell when comics are in the literary world now that um you know the new york publishers are like well, this comic is too short. We need a, pay, a comic that's 700 pages. Yeah. So all these graphic novels are getting ginormous. I mean, Habibi is like, what, <laughs> 900 pages? As much, as, love, as much as I love Craig Thompson, I'm not reading 900 pages of comics. It's, it's like a weapons-grade graphic novel. <laughs> <laughs> 
graphic novel reader, it would take me forever because not only am I looking at the words, now I'm looking at every little part. Every Craig Thompson draws amazing details, and I got to look at all the details and the flow and the shots and all that. Every page would take me like 30 minutes to read. That book would take me four years to read. You know, <laughs> I'm not reading. You know, and 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 as as great as Sailor Twain is, it's like 900 pages. Every book that seems to be pu getting published by New York publishers are so big. And I feel like people are like, well, that's how long uh, um, that's how long novels are. So that's how long graphic novels should be. And it's like it's not a, the same thing. You know what I mean? Texts like, have a density to them, don't they? Like a, a distillation. Yeah, but um, you know, I I I, um, I love uh, what anybody gets out of sumo. So I think it's it's a, a neat thing. But well, um, well, I I got on the comics cam here uh, a panel from the story. It's from page eighty five of the book. I'm wondering if you can pull it up. Um, and it, I don't know how, how well this is showing up on the screen, but like this is the bottom panel, the last panel of page 85. And uh -huh. Scott is looking, he, he's getting ready for the match, or the match is underway actually. And he looks out into the audience, and his friend is in the audience. And you did this lovely thing where everything is just washed in orange, and the only two light things in the panel are the girl and uh -huh. Scott's shoulder, this like rim light on his shoulder. Um, that's a storytelling moment that made that moment hang. The panels are all the same size, yeah. right? Uh, and so, like, in, the, in some of the earlier panels, as we could see on the camera, are, like, fast moments, like, like you know, slapping down, ramming into the guy. But that last moment hangs because of that framing that you did, and that's a narrative device. You wrote with color right there, right? So, yeah. A lot of times, you know, when you do things like that, um, because you've drawn comics for so long, you don't re you don't think about it. That's just what what you do, you know. And um, and it's neat to um, I, I when I read comics, I love you know I I, I love how people um, get you to feel certain things with a combinations of words and pictures, you know. Yeah. Sometimes, like my one criticism, I always make fun of Gene for is I always feel like he has too many words in his comics, especially in Level Up. I was always getting mad at him because I, you know there would be so many words on a panel my drawing would only be like this big <laughs> and I'd be like there's so many words why do we need this many words I can just draw what you're describing and um, I feel like that's always a fight between cartoonists um, what we do is that we got to fight with each other between or with ourselves between what we draw and what we write yeah uh, Lee is in the chat, and he's saying, "My second read through uh, of a, my second read through of a graphic novel takes hours. The first read only twenty minutes, and that that jives with my experience as well. Like I read Sumo once, all the way through, and then I read through again, and then I drank in all of the narrative texture in there that you put in with the color and with like the pacing moment choices and things like that." Yeah, I mean, there there are books like um, like Goodbye Chunky Rice or. Um, the, uh, like uh, Louis Rael, which is a Chester Brown book. Yeah. That I look again, it, it, every time I look at the book, it's completely different. And but not completely different, but I find something new and interesting that I didn't see before. And I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, that's the best. That's one of the better parts of this, this, this uh, medium. Um, we're going to get ready for book recommendations in a second. Uh, Aaron Helmrich is in the building to come in and do some book recommendations. And I got some of my own. But I want I want to real quick underscore one more time for everybody that this book is really 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 good really important. It's uh, I think it should be taught in comics classes. Uh, I'm going to be using it in my comics classes. No, I'm serious. Uh, this the and I'm not going to spoil the ending. But I said this in the pre-show. But goosebumps, serious goosebumps when I got to that ending. And you ended it. I, I've talked with um, my students in the past about. Uh, the difference between a happy ending and a satisfying ending. Yeah. And this has the satisfying ending. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty divisive ending. Um, there are people that love that ending, and there are people that hate the ending, and there's oh. people that are like, what? Um, and, uh, you know, it's neat. I, I love hearing how what people think about it at all, you know, because for me, this is a really personal book. I didn't really do it for anyone. I did it for myself, and I'm happy that people like it or love it or don't like it or whatever. But um, it's neat. It's like I, I wrote a letter to everybody and uh, everyone reading the letter. <laughs> some of them are like, oh, I love this letter. And some people are like, oh, this letter is OK. Um, but 
it, it's it's you know I, I wrote it to you and 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 uh, how you react to it is neat to see that reaction, and you know, I love that that you know I was t- I tell people all the time if I never do another book ever again you know I'm so happy that Sumo was out there in the world because um, there's no regret with Sumo I, I I flip through and never look at the book and say oh I could have done this better or I should do this or that Sumo the when you look at it is exactly how I wanted you to see it and exactly what I wanted to communicate to you, whether you like it or not dislike it, that's everything. And and I, I think like for a second for allowing me to um, put that out like to them into uh, like bookstores everywhere and to, um, um, uh, you know, make it more accessible to a lot of people. But um, but yeah, it's like my November rain or my um, stairway to heaven. You know? <laughs> I have never known for anything else other than that. I'm excited that that was out there, you know. I, I think you will be remembered for it. I, it's 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 a really really good book. Um, and again, like I said, it's very important. And I love the fact that the ending says uh, the what I got out of the ending was you're handing it off to me. Yeah. You're saying now now you go. You know, it's it's not important after this. You go. You do your thing. And that's 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 where the goosebumps came from. It was really nice. Uh, while we while Aaron Helmrich comes in to do our book recommendations, I want to give a shout out to you do a podcast as well. And I'm so excited to hear this because um, I'm always on the lookout for good uh, new good shows to listen to. The Comics Claptrap. Com- yeah. Comics with an X. Claptrap.blogspot.com. Latest episode was January 3rd with uh, Nick Abadzis, fr- uh, friend of the show. Love Nick Abadzis' work. Fun to talk to. He's uh, so much, so different from, you know, the way he thinks about art and comics is so different from me. I'm like more like, like I just draw it. And <laughs> like, um, like, you know, introspective about it. And it's fun. And, uh, and I'm just like, I just draw it. I don't know. I just draw the character. And he's just like, well, you know, you got to think about it. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, but, you know, for those people that, that that see me on shows like this where I'm super nice, if you watch the comic, if you listen to comics, um, Claptrap, please prepare to uh, know the real Tim Pham. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I first met you at ALA last year. And I remember uh, a friend of mine who knows you, a mutual friend that we have, kind of braced me for you he's like oh you're, you're tabling next to tin fam all right get ready buddy because he's gonna come off as a lot to handle but he's a super sweet guy he's like the sweetest guy in the whole world but when you first meet him he is such a handful and so you know i i brace myself I'm like what what's the deal with this guy how abrasive is he and i watched you and gene yang going at it and it was my own personal comedy series going on next door uh, I think if, when you experience the real Tin Fam and the spirit that he has intended, it is a joy to listen to. So I'm seriously looking forward to the show. Thank you so much. Uh, so with that, I will say, welcome Aaron Helmrich Hello. of the Ann Arbor District Library. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I just wanted to make note that we do have this book on order. It just has not arrived yet. So Sumo is on yes. order for a collection in the Ann Arbor District Library. Good to hear. <laughs> Um, so, okay, uh, we're going to do book recommendations. Yes. Tin, if you've got any of your own that you want to do any plugs for, feel free. But uh, we're just going to talk about books for a few seconds, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Um, well, this one seems apropos. It's a new one that we just got in the collection called Ichiro. Ichiro, I'm not positive on the pronunciation. Um, but it's about a boy who gets his, you know, he's got a Japanese mother living in New York. His father's died from the military. He gets sent back to Japan to see his grandfather and ultimately falls into a fantasy world occupied by the, the realm of the gods. Mm. So it employs actually some of the color changes. Oh, yeah. Um, Just like, yeah. That you were talking about before. Um, different then, scenes have different kinds of yeah. color palettes. And then this is the high fantasy um, god realm stuff here with the really full color. Um, but it, it's, it's awesome looking. It's got some really interesting art. Really, and really like like kind of soft, uh, loose brush strokes, kind of mm-hmm. sketchy brush stroke style. But you can tell, I mean, it's, it's like really well constructed. And stuff. another, you know, who put this out? Nice journey. Who is it by? I think it's, it might be Uni Press, but I'm not positive. Okay, well, we'll Let's link see. to it in the show notes. Yeah. Houghton Mifflin, actually. Houghton Mifflin. So the big guys are putting out nicer things lately. Um, actually, all the books I have today are about sort of journeys this one cardboard 
Are you familiar with the this Doug one? Doug to Naples cardboard, yeah. yeah. Anyway, this is an awesome one about a boy who gets cardboard for his birthday. He and his dad make a man. <laughs> and, you know, it starts out great. And then the neighborhood kid, um, the bad neighborhood kid, starts making evil things out of cardboard. And all sorts of things break loose at that point. Um, so it, it's a lot of fun, you know. I love the the illustrations with. Oh them. well, yeah, the Naples illustration yeah. style is just gorgeous. He did Iron West. Okay. He's the creator of Earthworm Jim, um, and I think he does like four graphic novels a month. Wonder, wow, <laughs> <laughs> he's like one of the most prolific <laughs> authors out there. And then um, my last one is just another good memoir. The it's called um, Tina's Mouth, the Existential Comic Diary. And within the book, she's um, constantly writing letters to John Paul Sartre. It's you know they're calling it. Um, in the style of Persepolis and American-born Chinese mm. um, because her family is Indian living in L.A. Um, so this is one has been getting lots of good. So it deals with some like press. cultural identity kind exactly. of Exactly, and her fitting in in high school and then you know being hyper-intellectual and coming from a hyper-intellectual family and trying to figure mm. that out with her other high school friends. And the art style is kind of like this weird middle ground between, say, like, uh, um, I'm trying to, like, pin it down, uh, Lucy Nisley yeah. and uh, um, Phoebe Glockner, somewhere in, in between yeah, those two. Yeah, kind of remind me. Yeah. yeah. So memoirs are always a lot of fun. Yeah. And then uh, there was one more in there? Or was... I had one more, um, Cat's Cradle. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but this is about... A girl who lives in a town where evil monsters live just over the mountains, and then there's people who tame them, and she wants to get um, into that, and ends up meeting a man with a horseless caravan who um, has a monster to sell. So she gets into the monster game and, and learns how to tame them. Really pretty animated style yeah. art, but with like a, kind of a limited, kind of cooler color mm -hmm. palette to it. Um, I'm just describing this for the folks who are listening to just the yeah. audio after the and fact. And these are, um, you know, all brand new. They're just waiting to be processed at the library. So they will be available at the Ann Arbor District Library, comics.aedl.org. I've got one besides Sumo, which everybody should get. Uh, I have one. I don't know how easy it is to get this. Uh, Jason Shiga's Knock Knock. You're, fa you're familiar with this, right, Ten? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> so, go. Uh, I, I didn't know if you wanted to, to talk about what this book is about, Tin, or if you just want me to take it. I, I saw the size of it and then didn't even pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jason Shiga, the author of Meanwhile, uh, he's, he's like a, a cartoonist slash puzzle maker. Uh, and this book starts with uh, a guy at your door with a gun and then he has like an instruction sheet on the on page two and your choice so here's you the character you wake up there's a knock at the door the guy who's the gun there and then all these items in the room are numbered and that's the page number you go to mm -hmm. if you choose to do you choose to go to the window do you choose to go to the tv do you choose to open the door and as jason says in the book is like uh most choices lead to death and disaster. <laughs> in fact, you'll probably have to die several times before you fully gain a sense of your situation in life. But if you strategize and choose wisely, success will be yours. Uh, I don't know, again, how hard it is to track this book down. But if you can find it, it yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I wish it was published uh, through a mainstream publisher. But uh, I picked this up at it's ALA. It's got an interesting binding and cover, too. Like yeah, this is hand, hand done. Yeah, no um, so it, find... So it's like, it's all um, Xerox. And uh, and hand taped. Jason does it all himself at his house. Actually, now he has he makes his wife do it. <laughs> and, uh, but you can order it through uh, just by emailing Jason Chiga, and and he'll send you one. And or if you go to any comic show, he'll have them. So more reason to find Jason at a show. Uh, and as a screen, it looks like wait wait a minute, this cover is not only just screen printed, it but he's got done. it's the the doorknob is like cut and pasted on here. It's like it doesn't get much more hand done than that. This is yeah. awesome. It takes them forever to put each um, each one individually out. Yeah. Wow. So, like, I mean, that that's that goes back to the mini comics thing, where it feels like the artist has like really handled this thing for you. Like, I saw the original bindings of the sumo minis; they were gorgeous with that Japanese binding, but it looked really time consuming. Yeah, I mean, I think the neat thing with uh, doing that, being part of that community with Jason and Gene and stuff like that, is we were always trying to. Um, 
uh, be better than each other. So it, all our mini comics were just getting increasingly crazier and crazier, you know? Yeah. Like, screen covers, hand binding. Now I'm going to tape this. Now I'm going to cut this. And you're like, uh. <laughs> We all should should say that. Uh, oh, did you have any book recommendations that you wanted to throw at us, uh, Tin? Well, you know, I, I've reverted. I, I, I'm just now really into Marvel uh, comics right now, and I'm, I just want to throw out that I really am enjoying this Hawkeye series. Really, in my fraction and drawn by David Aha, and I really am enjoying Uncanny X Men, part of the Marvel Now thing. I know it's kind of weird because I was so into indies for a long time, and now all I want to do is read like Wolverine and stuff. So. That's, I've been enjoying those two series. <laughs> That's cool. So what, what's so good about Uncanny X-Men? Because, I mean, as a guy who's been out of the superhero loop for a long time, it's like I think, oh, gosh, I don't want to have to go back to grad school in X-Men history to be able to read this book again. Well, they, they restarted one of their many times as they restarted. But I'm a huge fan. Um, I think is, is one of the best because he doesn't draw superheroes the way um, everyone draws superheroes. He, he, he has a very, like... Um, uh, indie comic aesthetic, but somehow he like snuck into the superhero world, you know. So it, I, I really like, I really enjoy his art. Oh, cool! All right, I'll have to, I'll have to take a look at it. And then um, the other thing I wanted to throw a plug out to you is uh, there's videos of you. If anybody is saying at the end of this, like, man, I need more tin in my life, uh, besides the podcast. Uh, you've got a series of videos on uh, KQED on their their channel, right? And there's like some how, how to draw comics videos. There's a video on Sumo. Um, there's a handful of videos on there that are, that are pretty substantially long. So uh, long in, as far as YouTube goes. So uh, we'll link to that in the show notes as well if folks want to hear more from you. But where where else should people find you? Uh, where else should they go to find you, Tin? Uh, well, you know, if you want to uh, um, follow that comic that I'm doing, it's called Please Don't Give Up. dot com, and I'm gonna start posting that on Monday. But that's pretty much it. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Cobra Talon. Uh, if you want to be my friend on Facebook, um, you know, send me a, a request. Um, yeah, you know, the KQED thing is neat because growing up, I, it's a public television channel. Growing up, I was always really influenced by this one show called. Um, um, Commander Mark uh, Draw Squad. Yeah, he's been on the show. He's been on Comics Are Great in the past. That was awesome. I taught him how to use Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> um, I love that show, and it made me draw want to draw. And so I was trying to pitch KQED that I could be the new Commander Mark oh. with like Commander Tin. And I've been trying to do that forever. And then they finally like kind of threw me a bone, and they were like, "Try this first, and then maybe." And so that's why KQD got on there. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So cool. But yes, I, I nominate you. I, I think that you you carry on the spirit in in a fresh 21st century way. <laughs> yeah, well, before we leave the show, I want to say draw, draw, draw. draw. <laughs> I got to hear him say that to me personally. That was like one of the highlights of my career. I know. And your microphone's cutting because you're so loud as you're freaking out about this, Tim. It's, it's, it was great. It was really great. I'll send, I'll send you a link to the episode. But uh, but anyway, yes, Tin, thank you so much for making time to be on the show today. It was really fun talking with you. Thank you, and I'm I'm super um, um I'm super impressed that your library has so many awesome graphic novels. <laughs> I hope that that all libraries do that as well. So keep up the good job. Thank you, you guys. Yeah. So okay. So uh, Aaron Helmerich, thank you Thanks. for showing up and doing the great book recommendations. Thanks to Matt Dubay and uh, Tom Smith, Eric Kloster, and Al. Oh my gosh, Al! I'm gonna just trounce all of your name. I'm gonna say Al. Al did a really awesome job uh, helping to do the technical producing of the show. The show will be archived at comicsgreat.com/cag74, and it will be at comics.aadl.org. You can follow uh, Tin Fam at Cobra Talent on Twitter. Aaron Helmrich, you are Gory Girl. Gory Girl on Twitter. If people want to follow her and harass her about books that should be <laughs> there, you go. Please do. <laughs> as the as the selector of graphic novels at the library. Uh, until next time, everybody. I have been Jersey Droz of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.